was only so much that could be done to the shape without losing supersonic ability. To give an example, the A-12 trainer, nicknamed the Titanium Goose, was not even capable of flight at Mach 2, far short of the standard aircraft's ability. Most of the serious candidates for the job of SR-71 pilot had logged over 3,000 flying hours. There were around three jobs a year, and one can only guess at the number of applicants. One pilot, Colonel Robert Powell, was to log a total of 1,020 hours flying the SR-71. This meant that he had more hours in his logbook at above Mach 3 than any other pilot in the world. In those hours, he flew over a million miles. He also earned 17 air medals and two distinguished flying crosses. Kelly Johnson led a team of designers that produced a string of remarkable aircraft. From the Second World War P-38 through the P-80, F-104, U-2, and the Blackbird family, his workshop became the most celebrated aviation think tank of all time. The designs produced were always adventurous, but practical assessments of the problem to be overcome. As an engineer, he was courageous, and as a team leader, he was a dynamo. He expounded simple virtues in a world of complicated considerations. It appears to have been his belief that his greatest achievements were in getting the best out of his subordinates. His only experience in supersonic flight came in the A-12 trainer. For the father of so many remarkable aircraft designs, this was surely an experience he would savor for many years. Kelly Johnson would probably have preferred a trip in each Blackbird, wouldn't we all? It is not surprising that there were so many applicants for the job of pilot. It is also not surprising that the criteria were exclusive. Selection for the training took about a year. Special care was taken to weed out Top Gun types. SR-71 operations required a steady, team-oriented temperament that was as important as a security clearance. The ability to manage the systems correctly and constantly was given as much weight as flying ability. At over 30 miles per minute, there is not much piloting to do once a mistake has been made. No one could be allowed to fly one of these birds like a cowboy. A critical key to the Blackbirds had been the development of a fuel that would not burn simply because of the heat in the tanks, which, like the rest of the plane, got very hot at high speed. In addition, unlike virtually any other fuel, it had to be burnable at extreme altitude. Once the fuel had been developed, other problems seemed small by comparison. Soon after each takeoff, the plane refueled. In some aspects, Blackbirds are quite basic. To allow for the expansion of the skin at Mach 3 heat, there are corrugations, like an old Ford trimotor. In addition, to save weight and complexity, the skins are also the fuel tanks. Fuel actually leaks from an SR-71 constantly until it heats up, expands, and seals the tanks. And, once hot, they stay hot. Even after a Blackbird lands, it is unwise to touch it, because you may burn your hand. Time did not pass these planes by. Admittedly, the pilots continued to face a traditional array of round dials, but the surveillance system cockpit became home to a procession of advanced technologies. As computers became smaller, 
the functional capabilities of these big spies increased. They already presented the peak of operational capabilities. An SR-71 can survey 100,000 square miles of territory per hour. That has been a fact for a very long time. What it can glean from that area in that hour has, during its lifetime, increased considerably. When work on the Blackbirds first started, a basic fact to be accepted was that normal tools, which are coated in cadmium, would cause corrosion of the titanium alloy. Normal tools were out. This aircraft was a major step forward. And everything changed. Or did it? Kelly Johnson probably thought that he was starting a new technological race, that the next generation of aircraft worldwide would be blackbirds of some sort or another, that the next step to higher speeds or perhaps more refined maneuverability would push past the new marks that his masterpiece had created. But that was not the way it went. The Russians developed small bands of high-speed, limited-range fighters, which were, in large part, drones, because their weapon systems were controlled from the ground. The pilot's only real function was to land and take off the aircraft and try to get the fighter in close proximity to its target. Apart from Soviet attempts at interceptors, Kelly Johnson's masterwork continued to rule the skies. What the CIA and U.S. Air Force did with them remains very secret. But there is enough information about their operational parameters and the equipment they could carry for one to spend hours in informed speculation about what they actually did. Back when Kelly Johnson's design team set to work on the problem of a U-2 replacement, they studied anything that could be considered a possibility. Among their early work was a proposal for a hydrogen-powered space aircraft, which Johnson described as a big flying vacuum bottle. This was well outside the technical ability of the time and was dropped. The plane that evolved bore no resemblance to a vacuum bottle, super sleek, futuristic, the A-12. It should also have been outside the technical feasibility of its era, but has flown into history as one of the greatest achievements in engineering and one of the greatest aircraft ever constructed. By 1990, the Air Force was paying a reported $400 million a year to keep its 20 SR-71s operational. And Congress decided this was too much. The allocation was canceled. The Blackbirds were doomed. They had spent their entire career in secret, 